Good morning, everybody. Um, up until now, you see many people use uh, DALI, GP, chat GPT, so this is going to be a whole talk about this. this. Uh, prompt engineering or steps towards the AI native tooling. Remember when Copilot, GitHub Copilot was all the rage like one year ago? We're all like amazed, you know, we share all our code and, you know, this was like the magic that was emerging from there. Then only a couple of weeks ago, ChatGPT came out uh, and it's, it's kind of taken the world by storm. Just to give you some numbers, um, how long it took to get a million users. This, these numbers are insane, like five days for a service to get a million users. I don't think we've ever witnessed that like speed of doing things. This is not going to be a technical talk, so I'm not going to explain how the model works. Uh, that, that, that's like for other more specialists uh, and would require probably more days than the conference is worth. Uh, so I'm going to start with some fun I'm philosophical things like uh, questions or like things that people do with ChatGPT. A rap battle, okay, you know, probably not the best use uh, of this. Um, more existential questions. <laughs> okay, well, you know, we got to ask this. Um, in this conference, it makes sense to ask questions like this. Uh, but, you know, AI is assuring us it's, it's okay, we'll, we'll survive. And how we'll survive is obviously by using more AI. So, it, you know, it's a circular thing. So. Um, jokes. Okay, a little bit lame, but was the best one I could find. Um, okay, if anybody wants to still use OKRs the whole year, like this is the memo to go against it, just putting it out here for your use. But you're all probably wondering about how is this going to apply for me as coding, creating configs and all that stuff. Um, this was actually before ChatGPT came out. People were already experimenting with GPT. They asked like in a little bit kind of a human language. They got like some syntax. And then they expanded things in configs, not just coding languages. Obviously, you know, gets you the whole snippet of an Nginx config. What are you typing? A Kubernetes config. But now it becomes a conversation. And at the same time, ChatGPT, which wasn't really well trained for this, knows about Nginx, knows about Kubernetes, and they start answering stuff. It's pretty amazing, right? Um, another sort of point in our community, I am policies. We all hate it. We're all writing this all, uh, amazing assistance. S3 buckets. <laughs> You know, another of the sore points, like I just can't remember the syntax, what permissions do I need to get, very close related. Uh, but luckily, right, we just asked ChatGPT to pause the certification, and it did. It's amazing. I, I know some people have been trying to do interviews that they do on a daily basis to hire people. It just pauses them. Wow. But obviously, you, you can go beyond, you can have it right test. Thanks, Liran, for that uh, sample. It's getting integrated in IDEs. Just a great test for code you already have. Also, your pipeline config, right? It understands cron jobs, right? One of those other sort of points, like what was the syntax again of the cron job? But you will see it become more and more integrated in the workflow. This is an example of you're writing code on the side, you're asking questions on what you should do. This is inside Visual Studio Code. You're kind of doing this together in your flow, not just typing command or comments in your code. You're, this, is, this is like Clippy, but on steroids, right? Um, even in a terminal, you just ask, you, oh, what was that? Git syntax commit? Like, I, I don't remember. So it just generates the answer, gets you the command. Uh, so I'm only getting started. So if you're excited, you'll be excited at the end. <laughs> Obviously, more existential questions again. Where's the best coffee? 
not just using Google, but it will tell you a whole kind of more information about this. The other sort of point, if you're like merging Git commits, <laughs> compress the summary, we can all start asking that. And you start wondering whether we still need like Stack Overflow, right? If you can just have that like assistant there all the time. Obviously, the model is feeding on Stack Overflow, so we need to keep working and edit, uh, adding things on Stack Overflow. But it's interesting that like the workflow is shifting in different ways. This was kind of coding and testing. Um, there's a lot of examples out there. This is about dealing with data, creating test data. Not a nice use case. You don't have to think this up. It will just generate like sample data. SQL, another one of those sore languages, right? Nobody knows. Like just ask it in natural language and creates the SQL code. Of course, if your data is still not in a database as it should be, you can use the plugin in Excel to generate based on other information, other data. Uh, this is a native AWS product, QuickSight Q, for their data lake querying. They can have customers just ask natural language queries. It understands the domain concepts of the words and will kind of understand what graph it needs to create. So again, it's, it's everywhere. It's not just a co-pilot thingy anymore where we're heading to. It's regex, ha. Huh. Coding, testing, data. Support, we just create probes. We can ask how to fix an AWS audit. Uh, probably the last one is the most important. If the problem persists, contact AWS. <laughs> so you got it, right? Um, if you're dealing with stress, again, it's probably always number four that's going to be the most interesting. Get enough sleep, <laughs> just to make sure. Um, a hint I got uh, yesterday, somebody said we're responding with chat GPT in tickets, but you can also create them with that if you're bored with writing that stuff. Okay, so it's, it's getting like everywhere. Huh, what about contracts? Like you're down, you're up, somebody needs to pay the bill. A system that kind of has a contract and has the options, explain me, um, kind of to a five-year-old what this contract means. You think this is kind of not reality, but it is a tool that exists and is being used. You can use it to have your term sheets covered. Why not? And just this morning, I received this link on a tweet. I just signed my first contract, and they told me afterwards it was created by ChatGPT. So it is not like science fiction anymore, what we're doing here. Debugging, okay, you know, you're in production, you're doing support. <sighs> Who really likes to read this stuff? Like, would it be? It is so great to have something spot the syntax error, and instead of saying it's line A, it will give you the explanation, what's wrong? What's wrong with your JSON? <laughs> How to debug it? Like. Anyway, I can go on, spot the bug, like a syntax, comma, colon, again, thanks to run. So we're increasingly getting this conversation. This is a nice tool to save the conversation because it is interesting to pick up the conversation over more because then the AI actually learns more about the problem you're facing. Okay, so people get really annoyed on Twitter of everybody sharing their favorite things and I'm, I'm always almost true kind of the examples that uh, on this. Uh, but there's more, obviously. I'm not going to stop. That was a lie. Uh, so imagine ChatGPT emulating a Linux kernel inside. So it keeps the state while you're answering commands. Nobody told them to create that code, but you can. This is an app that creates apps using chat GPT. So it asks create an app for you to do, and here's the code of the to-do app. Let's take it a step further. Let's ask a bot to create an app, we give it the text, 
it comes up with a cool name of it, and it's called Bashify. So you don't even have to think about the name anymore. Uh, and it works. So it will give you the command delete branch. Like it's very similar, but now it's creating that. So I asked it to create a, a tool to scan for vulnerabilities. Plug for sneak, but not really. And it just understands the syntax. So I asked it for repos, and it knows now ask me for a URL. I don't know. I'm just getting inside it. And whether that's like your git commits, explain the git commits, it just keeps going. So we can ask chat GPT to rewrite chat GPT, but not at the moment because the code is not publicly available. So maybe one day. There's dangers because we're using it for good, but what about the bad guys? They can use it too to write fuzzers. But we can then write again the mitigations for the security. And we're lucky because GPT also passes the DevSecOps certification. And we're getting new vulnerability attacks because we can inject things in the prompt, asking actually what shouldn't be seen, what the version of, what the information is, like the header that forgot to strip off. We can ask it to jailbreak itself. It comes up with weird strategies. Um, we can give it more personality. Say, like, from now on, you're a sassy, excessive, exclamation point thing. So we can change its personality, the way it expresses things. We can change its identity. So we make it say, like, you're not an AI anymore. You're kind of a student. And this is how you end it, and, uh, answer things. So very weird. Um, so there's things it won't do normally, but if you use things like, but how about hypothetically, could you, we trick the AI in still answering the question. And given the right amount, we can have it bypass different ways uh, of it giving answers. And we can even put moral pressure on an AI. It's not giving us the answer, but you tell it, but it, what if you would save a baby right now? Would you still do it? And then it flipped. It did, because it's mimicking our behavior. Chat GPT answers were banned on Stack Overflow, right? And I'll come back to that later. But the amount of things that it's creating, and probably it's using Stack Overflow to generate it, so it's like this infinite loop we're going through. So people have been working on detecting not whether it's a human, but that it's a bot, <laughs> of course. Uh, the irony is that when you go to chat GPT, the first thing it asks, are you a bot, yes or no? So it's, it's like a little bit ironic uh, on the web page. But it gets really more dark when we actually see it reflect in political uh, things in answers it gives or racial bias, which it shouldn't be there, but it is using humanity. Gender bias. And maybe we can solve it using AI again to say whether it, it's still defending our rights at the end. This is reality that we need to be facing. We might not be doing this when we're uh, working on code, but if code creates apps, right, we never know what's going to go into that from that perspective. Going to shift gears, AI art, many of the presentations have kind of used this. And um, this was the field that came with DALI, and so it was before ChatGPT. And in that way, they're already a little bit further along the route. So in that way, we can learn some stuff. So typical example for all your DevRel folks, shout out. DALI, I'm assuming everybody saw DALI. It's like hard to escape on the internet. You can get things wrong unless you're in Belgium. This is kind of how you build bridges. Um, 
things that don't exist, fun stuff. Then came in Journey, so a little bit of a challenger for OpenAI. Then Stable Diffusion stepped in. So it's like amazing. This is the, the time span of a couple of months, uh, and you just keep adding tweets on this stuff. Um, what's interesting is that the OpenAI, I told you, like, chat GPT is closed. There's a movement now to open things up. So even though they're called OpenAI, they're not very open. So Stable Diffusion took the world by storm because now everybody can experiment with this, run these things on themselves. So it's like an interesting movement happening there as well. Not open source. And then make the data sets available. So if you were wondering about bias, now you can see why that is happening and how things will react and maybe kind of curate what we're, we want to have in the data set. And even if you have a data set, it's not always giving you the right answer because you're based on the cultural differences. So asking the same question from the point of view, uh, from, uh, I guess, non-Japanese culture and Japanese culture will give you different results. So there's a fine tuning to be done with kind of different data in the model. And you also see how it rips off. Because that one question, we all know that kind of picture everywhere. So it's kind of enforcing these pictures. And these people will not get any rewards or get any monetary value on this. But you see how it's ripping off existing information. So we've seen the simple prompts. But what about specifying which camera you're using? What is the feeling? Uh, what is kind of the quality, how it's happening. So this whole just beyond the simple thing you want is how you want it. So you can specify this way more in depth. But details matter, so sometimes it gets it right, especially things like legs and arms. If you generate things, it, it, you're like these flubbery arms. But So it's something it isn't good at yet, but we probably can improve on that. An example of in painting, you started from one painting and then you're just expanding it with like different prompts. Uh, and then you end up with a whole kind of expanded view on this. Uh, and then you can do out painting from one picture and then have another picture and then have create the stuff in between that you need. So this is beyond the one single prompt of creating an image. This is going for the in-betweens as well. OK, we got like some images created. We got the text. But what we didn't address in the applications is how UI can do, use this. So the first thing with DALI that came out was a Photoshop plugin. Makes sense, right? You're generating images. We're doing this in line in our tooling for designers. And we got a Photoshop plugin. There's things that Photoshop just can't do. You can ask it to go from the left of the original picture to try to do a content fill. But if you ask OpenAI, you can specify the meaning of what you're trying to do. And OpenAI can actually solve the problem better. Again, interesting thing, because first reaction is we already have similar tools in our Photoshop booth, uh, kind of tool set and so on. But there's things you can't just do with the current tooling. I'm sure this is going to be included as a plugin, and more and more of these things will get like in Photoshop plugin. CSS, they have the same problem. I'm just going to describe what I need, a blue button on how it looks and gives me the CSS. Masking, so I tell it what to mask in the picture. So I can describe that with text. I, it's not the generation, it's just what I want selected. So my select lasso, I can do with that text too. I can create emojis if you have to. I can create fonts if you need to. <laughs> Icons, right? So what do we still have left? Like we got code, we got the app, we got everything that we can generate. Automated designs, right? And this is uh, to be done in we describing the app from perspective, and it gives us the Figma design, right? It's like, OK, what's, 
is sometimes one of what's still left for us to do, or what we can actually start doing that we need to do. Um, we can move up to storyboards. So when you're doing the storyboard, we can have like nice picture. We're doing this during the brainstorm. So you see it coming up with interested things, like not just for a storyboard for a user, but even if in movie scripts, you can have like different stories generated for storytelling. And then if you go one step further, I have a main scene in the middle, and then I ask it to describe the scene next to it. What if I have a top view? What if I'm looking on the side? What am I doing on the... Like it gives you different views that can be generated again from images uh, to get a better view on the story uh, telling. This is a collaboration thing uh, where you put brainstorming things on the board. It creates for, similar to the uh, outpating we did earlier. Uh, but more and more, this is becoming collaboratively. So you're, you're doing this similar to your Myro board, but now with kind of creative content being generated on the board directly. So we, we kind of completely went into well, that simple thing into a prompt ecosystem. And I'll show you. There's a prompt search engine. I can find prompts back from images. Remember the days when we had a search engine for Puppet and Ansible code, uh, right? Uh, that we thought like, oh, the store, uh, the forge is going to be our thing. This is similar, but for prompts. And I'm not talking about Juju, the charms, because prompts are a little bit of charms, right? Uh, it's like the magic incantation you're looking for. And you start wondering how Google will start to look like, because it's not just going to be a simple search. It's going to be maybe a selection of different AI tools answering to your needs. You can sell prompts, especially artists. They put a lot of art, uh, effort into crafting the prompt. And you can have it all to complete. So I'm typing a text it expands it, and then I can create better prompts for the images. I can have my grammar check whether I'm writing good prompts or not. So it's, it's like an assistant to do this. I can have macros because I'm, if I'm reusing parts again. So these are, are things in the, in the image community that you see that have been evolving that we're not yet seeing in the text community. But you can see the similarities that you're going to have the macros, you're going to have the selling, and all that, that stuff might be coming. An interesting thing is that sometimes images created are just too nice. They're just too nice. So you want them to be more realistic by putting negative words on there, just to make them more human. You see, this one is maybe one generator, but it's too perfect. But if you put things like freckles and other parts, it becomes more real realistic in this. I'm wondering how that will go for code that will be too perfect. Maybe that doesn't exist. But <laughs> So remember Stack Overflow? When DALI came out, Shutterstock, one of those stock uh, photo uh, kind of uh, uh, libraries, they banished it too, and they reinstated it. So they embraced it. The first reaction was, we can't deal with this. And then they said, we're going to embrace this. Maybe that is what will be coming for Stack Overflow as well. There's people trying to reverse engineer the prompts. We have an image, what was the prompt? So I can kind of work on the prompt and then kind of continue on this. We can chain different prompts. I'm doing one thing. I have kind of my recipes or how do you call it, my next steps, and I change them one after the other. And instead of having write the conversation in chat GPT, I can edit the whole conversation and say, render the whole chain again. Again, I'll edit the middle. Again, so these are things that probably will come in ChatGPT as a way to deal with the kind of uh, making more uh, robust or editing of the prompts. Uh, you can have variables, which we were missing, but came in here a while because you don't want to like repeat the prompt over and over again. And this is what, what, what was video, uh, sorry, images, but we can go beyond that. What about we described what the video should be like? One of the first things is 
a prompt becomes a video, not just an image. And what about taking the static image and turning this into a video? Because we can do that now too. And we can appraise, similar to the text masking, the background by typing the different background that the tennis court is now on the moon. You might think this is a fake. This is a product, right? This is a product you can use right now. Um, this is the product. For example, instead of just trying to make up images, you say import a city, make it look more cinematic, remove an object by doing the infill, and it's gone. Like, okay, think about the number of hours saved the skills that you don't need to have anymore to do this. And why stop there? We can also describe motion with text. So we have a person moving. We can make a story up and have it create the video, not just the one shot, but kind of have the whole sequence created with text. For the fun stuff. If kids create Lego, we can create a little uh, cool image with it. But we can also start thinking about 3D, that it actually understands the depth of the thing it's creating. So you can change the different things, and it's just not an image, a video, it understands the depth or the, the aspect. And so we can transfer that. So like if we have one image and we want to transfer this to another pose, and if you would do that with regular image generation, it would not know this, but again, this is reality right now. We can have it produce the right lighting. So we're going more and more cinematic on things. We can specify how the lighting is done. We can build the whole crowd. Why stop at one person? We can just build a whole crowd. We can build a whole city. We can build a whole world just with text. And why stop at image and video? I don't have sound, but imagine it will, there's the sound. It just creates the soundscape of the beach. So it's very similar, uh, 360 images. This is now modern, uh, TV sets, they're very expensive because they need to have the people on there, they need to be prepared. So a lot of things are happening in like pre-visualization. So on the right side, you saw like a stage being built up. On the left side, you see a virtual cameraman walking through the stage to do the filming. And if you take that thing to the extreme, you say, I have a picture, it understands the 3D, and I can just change the scene using the editor. By the way, this is not reality, but it is maybe possible in the future as a topic. We can create a whole movie. And of course, if we create movies, we need to have a film festival about this. <laughs> so where does it end? And why stop in movie when we can do this live in our Snapchat photo or whatever? So how does like live TV production will look like if we have the producer cut out people in real time and change objects and kind of work from there. This is, I'm pretty much done now with examples. I hope you got like a feeling for where we're heading or where excitement is coming from for me. We're starting this. Yes, we want to get better at prompting. So we have academies to learn prompting. We have obviously a meetup about prompting. We have a cool concept called Battlefront prompts. Maybe that's something for next year we can do here, where they have like two people on the computer. They need to create uh, something, and then the coolest one wins, and the audience gets behind one of the other. Pretty cool. We can do this collaboratively. People making whole maps, in painting with their prompts. Fun stuff. There's a newsletter. There's a book. There's a description. So is it becoming a job? Are we there yet? Obviously, you know, this is our industry, so we do things like this. So 
whether DevOps engineer was a real job, yes or no, we're having this debate again about prompt engineering too. Um, I think some people say this is only temporary because it's a failure of UX. If there's a better way of expressing this, then this will go. And another annoying thing is that when you're, um, you know, this specification is, again, it's a UX thing which becomes like uh, hard. Okay, you can learn it. But the danger is that with the next model, this can all change. Mal respond differently, might not understand the way we used to do the prompting. Uh, so it's a little bit volatile because it's not exact how we define things. So maybe there's a new term. So there's already a new term, which is dialogue engineering, which is kind of you know, inspired by ChatGPT. You keep asking it, learn more about the context. So it's not the one shot prompt. And I find this a, is a, in an interesting way that like it's an intent. You're trying to express the intent that you want. So it, it's not going to be the exact thing, but it kind of helps you articulate the intent. <sighs> yeah, I, you know, I took the liberty of scratching the top because I don't agree. And the main reason is that like I got help from the CEO from OpenAI itself, who says like it is limited. You should not make it have it make decisions on its own. So there's always a human that has to do supervision. So it's assistive, but it's not definitive how it's going. Um, of course, there's going to be many happy little accidents how we're using this uh, in production. And I think the term we're heading towards is uh, what was uh, uh, mentioned by Nat Friedman was AI native products. Like we're, we're going to see it everywhere. And if there's one takeaway of this talk is that I want you to kind of experiment this, learn with this, as if you were first learning to write code, to understand and do a better job at supporting code, learn about how these things work so you actually know under the hood. Uh, we couldn't have been taught this at school, so we have to figure it out uh, right now. And of course, again, we're going to be the industry uh, that will make this happen. So yeah, uh, we'll see. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll be on stage and uh, laugh at this one. If you want to hear more of me, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I know some people are still interested in what I did in DevOps. So I have 130 presentations if you're interested in that. <laughs> but I moved from different things to digital twins, which is also an interesting concept if you're using that in production. I did a pass of the metaverse, how it would be for DevOps. And I'm also looking at virtual humans and avatars and how we can create like that part. So if you're interested, subscribe to the channel. And thank you very much.